Welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Fort with Jaspreet Singh, the CEO of Druva. I'm going to dive right in as I always do and ask about today's toughest problem. You guys are a startup growing quickly, just raised around, uh, what is it, almost 150 million, significant right. uh, $2 billion valuation. So well beyond unicorn, uh, but we're in this challenging time where there's a pandemic um, and companies have to change the way that they do so many things. Um, but we're also coming out of that. I don't know, what's the biggest challenge, the toughest problem you're facing right now? Thank you for having me, John. I think the, as, as we look at the pandemic and even before pandemic, uh, the toughest problem we start trying to solve is, you know, as most businesses are trying to be on internet, be to solve the supply chain or to solve the delivery or distribution, you know, they all want to digitalize themselves through, you know, the re rethinking of data. Data is the core of this digitalization or, or of them being on internet. And Druva is trying to solve this ever-growing need of data. Data is doubling almost every year. It's facing a lot more threats from ransomware or, you know, malwares or, or facing more litigations or, or compliance issues. At the same time, there's a massive re-architecture effort around data as well. So how do you protect it? How do you safeguard it? How do you really make it work? Make it available for enterprises all the time across enterprise. Uh, that's the problem we're trying to solve. Snowflake had a big, big uh, IPO, and that at least got the market thinking more about data. You know, um, the public markets, private market have been paying a lot of attention to it for a while. Did that shift the ecosystem at all for you, or at least the types of conversations that either customers or potential investors are having? Very much so. I think data and cloud as a combination has become a very lethal combination to sort of solve this new age of problems, uh, which is happening across across multiple industries. So customers have been more and more open to sort of understand how does cloud apply to their core infrastructure, right? If you think about cloud since 1998, has been dominantly focused on applications like you know, uh, CRM was the first one, or Salesforce was the first one to go cloud, and then came other applications like Workday, or uh, and then then came the infrastructure slowly, security, databases, you know, like MongoDB and others. And now it's hitting the infrastructure management at the gut of the enterprise, which is data. And as this transformation sort of takes place, uh, companies like you know, you know Confluent or Snowflake or Druva are at the core of this digitalization effort to happen across the enterprise. Absolutely. Um, what, what about the challenge of leading employees through a, a period like this? What have you learned during this time? I think we learned a lot. And again, back to your opening statement about, you know, this, this pandemic is, is here. We actually still not sure if we're end of an era, or end of a pandemic or beginning of a new era, right? So it's uh, the unknown is pretty, pretty common. And, and, and uh, you almost, you know, it's very hard to understand like what's going to happen next or how should you plan for it. The, leading, the, leading the company and employees in a time of uncertainty um, has been actually a very enriching, humbling, and learning experience for, for, for me personally and all of us at Druva. It started off by how do we enable them to be better at their work and then take care of their personal times and their young parents and you know a working, working mom. It's all over the map and how do we really make it make it happen and now the empathy and then still leading the customer challenges. We saw a rapid adoption of a platform last one year. So how do you deal with the rapid business growth and the employee uncertainty through the year has been a humbling and enriching experience through the year. We've learned a lot. And what about for you? I mean, you've got your own human startup uh, happening at the same time that you're <laughs> leading a business startup. I mean, that's got to be its own challenge, right? Oh, totally. Uh, we have a three-year-old, uh, and uh, you know, and and when the pandemic started, my wife also works for a startup, and 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 you know, she works for Waymo, uh, the the driverless car company, and so it was both of us. And initially, it was it hit us like you know, uh, the the daycares are closed, and like how do you still provide for your family and at the same time take care of work? So we were we tried everything to start with, you know, try taking some time off, try to do part time. I'd work the morning, she'd work the afternoon, and again, switch back, back and forth. So there's a lot of hit and miss and trial, and, and that also taught us empathy towards employees and what's maybe happening at a customer or an employee, and how do you, you know, how do you still make the business goals meet and at the same time 
you know, take care of the employee. So it was a definitely a humbling experience to sort of watch her react to pandemic and and then, you know, and then apply the same logic to business and, and grow at the business as well. That, that's so important, I think. I, I think I remember a story of, it was either Sheryl Sandberg, it might have been Sheryl Sandberg talking about being at Google and being pregnant and going to Larry Page and Sergey Brin and letting them know, hey, we need to deal with the parking situation for uh, pregnant women. And it's like, it's it's employees uh, and and highly placed executives in some cases going through these experiences and having access to the decision making that that helps those adjustments to happen, it seems like. Um, what sort of a lasting legacy do you think this period is going to have? Yes, for what we've been talking about, which is, you know, some of the more uh, people centered aspects of work, but also for technology and the way we value it. Great question. I think it, it it should have a lasting and a generational shift towards the thinking towards technology. If you think about where, uh, even think about like where government spending typically happens, right? We we have about two million people in 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 U.S. military, and you know one million active forces and one million over reserved, and you know, there, there's a massive spend on 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 military operations. And if you think about the likelihood of the next war, right? Would it be a uh, hand-to-hand -hand combat or an air-to-air -air combat or, or, or very likely could be a, a cyber war or a, or a bio war, right? Uh, this, this, this happened to be a pandemic. This happened to be something which was, you know, just so much happened by luck, by chance. But, you know, what if this was constructed? What if this was constructed in the future, right? And, and what happens then and how, how does we prepare towards those kind of environmental shifts towards what's happening, right? To think about, should we have a reserve of doctors? Should we have a reserve of nurses, equipment, manufacturing? Uh, what about cyber? What about security professionals? I think it'll it'll cause a sectoral shift in thinking about how does a country, a nation, prepare against an event like this, uh, either you know by chance or by man-made. Um, and then how do, how do you think about like preparing the entire country behind it, right? So that, I think that will cause some thinking about technology, thinking about optionalities uh, across those sectors, including the government. Now, I like to uh, go back when I'm talking to CEOs and founders and get their origin story. And, you know, when I say go back, I mean, go all the way back. So um, where were you born? Uh, tell me about your parents, household situation, any siblings? Yeah, appreciate the question. I was born in India, northern part of India. My dad was in Air Force, so uh, Indian Air Force. So we moved around quite a lot. I was born in a city called Amritsar, which is known for the Golden Golden Temple, for those who know India. Uh, I moved around quite a lot growing up, but I learned a lot from my dad's hard work and grit, and he was a he was a military man, and he was a land-to-air missile expert, and, and learned a lot from him, and I grew up and went to a eastern part of India for schooling, a called IIT Guwahati, um, you know, and uh, and and some, some hard lessons learned from both my parents, and once entrepreneurship was sort of coming my way. I remember going for student exchange program in Germany and, um, you know, it sort of occurred to me and hit me that entrepreneurship is sort of uh, for me uh, s somehow in that in that whole experience. And I and I came back and sort of, you know, completed my education and, and wanted to wanted to do something with life beyond uh, beyond a job. And, and, and entrepreneurship uh, occurred to me quite a bit. Let's stay in the early part for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're you're growing up, you're moving around a lot. What were you into as a kid and how did you make connections when um, you had to move so often and maybe some of those social connections get broken? Fantastic question. So uh, in, India is a very, very diverse country. Uh, to, to set the context, there are about 28 main languages and there are five major religions and, and, and almost four different races, right? Uh, it's a subcontinent with almost four different races uh, coexisting in the same con subcontinent. So to move around every three years was to learn a new language often, uh, to interact with the the, the, the local, uh, the, the sub-local population, to learn a new culture, to be making new friends. Uh, my mom could speak like three to four languages and count in like six of them. My dad could understand. So diversity as an element was sort of in green, right? Oh, cool. Even within India, like the, the the subculture I come from, Sikhism is almost like one percent of the entire population. So diversity was ingrained that you have to face diversity, understand people, understand perspective, speak languages, 
and learn quickly, learn to make friends quickly, new environments quickly, new school quickly, was very, very fascinating. And, and I didn't realize it, but growing up and coming to Bay Area, which is again a melting pot, could immediately connect the dots backwards saying, I, I thrive and enjoy in the culture of multi-generational, multilingual, multicultural aspects of life. What, what are some of the uh, early experiences that you had that kind of trained you to, to, to adapt in those situations and appreciate the, the differences? Because, you know, that's, I think, so poignant and important for this time that we're in and people's understanding of you know, how universal that need for cultural adaptation is. Um, many, many ways. Right? I, I remember clearly, so once I was uh, actually not so early in my life, but like almost when I was like 15, 16 years old, actually a little bit later, maybe 18 years old, I was I was back from college and I, I wanted to, my dad was in a special assignment and he was going all across the northern border of India to actually meet his his direct in command. And I, and I requested him, could I actually follow him in a civil car behind him for one month and just, you know, be a observer of what he goes through on a day to day basis. And slept in bunkers, met different people, met adversaries. And one touching moment was this one particular, you know, uh, unit where, you know, I wouldn't name for obvious reasons, but this unit had, um, you know, the in India, there's, there's a Sikh regiment, the, the regiment which is, you know, people who, you know, we're turban like me and they have, have a regiment and they were running a particular unit which had a temple, which is a Hindu temple. And, and somehow they had to man it. So, so, and to actually observe it and to, you know, make sure it goes forward. And there was also a church, a, a Catholic church, the same vicinity. The military sort of moves with the, and in this case, it so happened being a bordering state, the Sikh gentleman had to understand Catholic prayers and the Indian prayers to sort of make sure he can, he can run both the places simultaneously open for public. So those aspects of that, you know, circumstances is what we face, but the response to it and how we open and adapting to different cultures and dynamics in a very adverse situation, being a, on the border of India and Pakistan and mining this, this, this tiny little town and different, different, uh, you know, places of worship was an eye opening for me in, in many, many different ways. Yeah. At 18, that's amazing to see. Mm -hmm. um, with, how, how long after that were you in an environment where you had to put some of that um, that impression that you got to use. I think I would say ever since, um, uh, you know, uh, ever since, especially when I came to states, uh, diversity is a, a much spoken topic here. Probably many, much, much more than many other parts of the world, right? Uh, for for obvious reasons. So um, you know, what I learned growing up and sort of how do you apply it to be uh, your work environment or you know, or, or, your, or when you meet with customers or you travel, well, has been an enriching experience sort of throughout and some life lessons to be, I guess none of us ever give, give up learning. So some, to some degree, still learning and adapting and growing on the same, same, uh, you know, same spirit. So talk to me about uh, engineering and mm -hmm. how your love for uh, technology grew. Where did that come from? When did that start? Great question. My, uh, my brother growing up was a, you know, exceptionally talented, uh, you know, young kid. And, and he, you know, he was scored number six in all over India on math Olympiad, you know, was, I think, internationally acclaimed for math, uh, went to IIT, ranked very, very well. He actually ended up being, you know, building a core part of WhatsApp. He built the voice and video calling for WhatsApp single-handedly, right? Uh, so he did very, very well. So sort of watching him again, was sort of a life lesson for me to sort of seeing so much ingrained in math and core as you know core fundamentals of physics and you know I was I was not a very uh, you know very serious kid growing up and just just you know in, in some degree getting inspired from older brother was sort of a way for me to get deeper into tech. But now, what somehow, do you mean? What do you mean you weren't very serious? <laughs> I actually was. I actually wasn't very much. Life. I've been accidentally succeeding in life, like my principle in life being, how do you avoid making this, how do you make enough small mistakes to avoid the big one? Uh, you know, so, so I've been just barely catching on to the life events and, 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 and going next and next. And, and at that time of time, my brother happened to be the one pulling me forward. Um, you say you weren't serious, but what is it that you were focused on? 
You know, as a uh, great question, I was, uh, you know, there was a lot of things which inspired me growing up. Uh, if if I have to go down the memory lane, I was uh, I was I was decent in sports. I used to play soccer growing up and and cricket, and I was decent in. Um, uh, art and especially in drama, uh, I was um, you know did did very well in in sort of multiple areas, and I was sort of okay in studies. But it, you know, a country of billion point two to actually get into IIT and to computer science, you know, it requires a a different mindset almost, right? Good is an enemy of great in that context. So you you have to compete with almost like of you know millions of students in us every year to get to the top. Thousand or two thousand, actually get to top, top five hundred to give it to get to computer science across the country of one point two billion. So the mind shift. I was I was decent growing up and did, did a lot of things well, but the mind shift that I, I need to compete with millions like me and to get to the top five hundred to get to computer science. That mind shift happened when I saw my brother succeed, um, and, and you know and, and learned uh, many many things from it. Um, I, that that sense of focus and competition and uh, finding your own path through it is a theme that I've heard again and again with executives. And you know, even living in Silicon Valley, I, was, I lived out there for about 13 years, seeing how um, different young people uh, adapt or not to kind of hyper competitive environments and this idea, unless I'm at the very, very top all the time, you know, does that mean that I can't succeed? Um, I wonder if you found some benefit over time in the way that you have been able to adapt, compete, succeed, and maybe not have that mindset that tends to get praised or lifted up as being uh, of being you know number one from the very beginning. I mean, not everybody needs to be number one from the very beginning, right? I think that's a great question, and I've also always wondered the same question myself. I think it comes down to like. Uh, uh, like I was in a workshop, and, and the workshop was all about how do you become the best yourself. And I kept on thinking through the workshop, like, why do I care to be the best myself? Uh, and I couldn't get to the answer in the workshop. And I raised the question, and the, the speaker was, he was like, "What do you mean? You got to be best yourself." And I was like, "Why do I care to be the best myself all the time?" Right? I think the answer is deeper than what you believe in and what you truly enjoy doing, right? And what you strive to do in life. And oftentimes, growing up unknowingly is sort of my learning that you, you watch your parents. And in my case, my mom was had an enormous amount of grit and the high, almost the highest IQ person I've met. Um, and sort of almost, uh, you know, learning and learning that behavioral thinking about grit and perseverance. But then you eventually in an adult would apply to what truly gives you joy and pride and sort of becomes a better self through truly make it happen. And, and to me, it occurred to me truly when I founded Druva and something I enjoyed doing and, and it was fun to sort of, you know, challenge myself that I can learn faster than many others in my domain because I enjoy this so much. And then I also can take more pain than most others because I care so much. So combination of those two became, you know, almost becomes very, very good for any individual to grow. So give me a, a sense then, we, we've gotten into your teen years a bit, you're focusing, you're getting more serious, you're seeing what your brother is doing. So when he goes to WhatsApp, how early mm -hmm. in the process is that? What are you doing? Um, have, you, have you already caught on to that seriousness or, or not? That's a fun story, actually. So I, I moved to States in 2000, and uh, I believe after, like, I think I had some issue with the visa authorities and stuff, finally I figured out, I, I finally came here to 2000. 11 uh, land here, and my brother is doing a is a key engineer in a startup called Seago System, which got acquired by uh, Seago uh, Nova Systems, got acquired by Cisco, became UCS, very very successful. Um, and he's he watches me do a startup, and he got curious, and he was like, I'm going to leave my job and do something. And I, and I was like, Great, um, you know, let's let's uh, let's both of I was living with him in his house because I had nowhere to stay, um, and we both were talking about startups, and one fine day he says, I'm going to build a startup to do voice and video calling. And I'm trying to tell him, there are many, many, many out there. There's nothing much to do here. Why are you wasting your time building voice and video startup? It may be a bad idea, and I'm using all the wisdom I've somehow gained in my short stint of a startup to educate him and advise him not to do it. And he still does it, and he's pretty bullish about it, and he builds a very, very great startup, uh, which got very, very successful. 
And then one fine day, he came to me and asked for advice saying, hey, I'm getting an offer to get, get bought by this company called WhatsApp. And should I take stock? Should I take cash? And then again, in my expert self, I gave him the best advice possible saying, dude, I don't even know what, what WhatsApp, take all cash. And as he was, he came back and refuted me saying, you know what, I think about, I'm going to do all stock. <laughs> and, and the rest is history. I think uh, John and, uh, and I forgot the CTO's name, they trusted him a lot, made him the responsible for voice calling and video calling, which they thought may not over time be as successful, but then he just kept on building and growing, and you know it happened to be a. I, I chuckle myself now because it's a it's a lesson, a reminder, right? That you know you can never be hundred percent sure, and it's the, the the benefit of doubt or the or a self doubt is always good and reflective for growth. And be careful on what you end up advising on. Tell me about the formation of Druva because you've already gotten the entrepreneurial bug. You're working uh, on ideas. And Druva itself has been through a number of pivots over time. So that that sense of adaptation that you grew up with moving from place to place uh, and understanding different places, different people, you know, playing out in business as well as you've you know, understood when things need to change. Um, tell me the, the origin story of Druva. What what were you doing that led to the initial idea? Yeah, great question. I think in general, I mean, look, Bay Area is a Hollywood for geeks in many, many ways that people want an overnight success and everybody wants an overnight success. And at least at Druva, we, you know, we, we faced a lot of hardships uh, throughout uh, the, the building process. I founded a company uh, with my co-founder, my two co-founders um, back in 2008 you know, timeframe uh, when the timing actually wasn't good, the market was going down. We were coming out of a company called Veritas after one year of sabbatical to really build, uh, initial idea was to build, um, you know, business continuity solution for financial systems. Uh, and he built a great software, three of us. One year down the line, we realized one of us, uh, actually the CEO of the company back then, I was the first founding engineer, not a CEO. The CEO has uh, has cerebral palsy, right? Uh, and and uh, he has to retire early. So now we two of us left. And still want to passionately follow the idea. There's no money in the market. There's no money for a deep tech, comp deep tech company out of India. So uh, especially, right? So we we keep on building and we build a great software. And then you know it occurred to me uh, and it occurred to both of us that we got a, we got a call with a with a customer and an actually good advisor, which happened to be a good great advisor throughout the years, saying that no one is looking to buy a fancy car from Argentina, right? Like no one is looking there. So. If you're building a deep tech financial system software company out of India, unfunded, you know it's going to be a it's going to be a hard thing. So we made the first pivot to build something which you could sell over the internet, which is easy to people when they, before they buy the software. It's a smaller transaction of a backup system, which could they could buy over an internet and much easier to trust versus a man-to-man, door-to-door, high-end uh, financial system selling, uh, and that was very very successful. Uh, we immediately found takers of an IP. We sold to many, many companies across the globe. We got amazing companies go knock at the door and, and bought for, in, including a, a US, you know, US base in Afghanistan deployed it massively. So making a lot of success and a good deal of money and growing organically. And then I got a knock from a door from Sequoia Capital, a, a young partner who had just been to India, uh, Shilinder Singh. And, and he introduced me to Mike Morich. Mike was running Sequoia back then and Mike happened to be in Mumbai. And the first billionaire, you know, I chuckle, uh, sort of, I met in my life, uh, okay. you know, thoughtfully. So he was, he was an amazing person and still is. And then and, and, and meet, meet Mike every now and then, whenever I can. But, uh, and, and then Sequoia, I feel, uh, like the idea of someone solving a deep tech, prob deep tech problem from India. And they funded the company, but then requested that I move the base to the Valley because Valley is where the, the tech talent is to actually scale the company. Hmm. Right? So... I, I, you think I, that was right? Absolutely right. I think um, from a concentration of talent, see the engineering, like when I was in Veritas, when I was in the previous job, my counterpart in the US had 5x better machine, better knowledge, better uh, peer circle to solve the problems I was solving. So I, was, I always felt disadvantaged, right? Uh, when I was in Veritas in India, right? Fast forward now with, with cloud and mobile and internet, the technical barriers are less so uh, there, but the concentration of skill set. Like US isn't a place for innovation necessarily to, to take birth anymore, given the, given the equalization of the world. 
but it's still a phenomenal good place to scale that innovation. Mm. I believe it will kick butt for next 20 years to come on scaling innovation and solving some tough problems to solve. So great move and great push by Sequoia to get here. It did take me multiple attempts to get here uh, because there was no precedence for a CEO who looked like me to get an entrepreneur visa and to be in Bay Area. I had to hire myself, you know, because there was no visa for entrepreneurs. So, uh, but eventually ended up being here, found great advisors, great employees, great, great business partners, great money to sort of scale for the next few years. Come 2013. Explain the, explain the hire yourself part. Well, in H1B or L1 process, uh, you, someone has to hire you. You, you. you can't hire yourself. So the visa works in a way that who is hiring you. So as a CEO, you have to explain who's hiring you. So you have to either common practice is to hire a CFO who hires you or, or you hire a board member who hires you and you have to submit a business plan and you have to prove then how you're the legitimate person and you're not, not going to run with the money and how your criminal history is all clean and then finally get a shot to be here. That, those are a lot of hoops to jump through. Uh, oh, absolutely. A lot of learnings to have. <laughs> I mean, you know, processes can always be improved. I, I remember talking to Satya Nadella about his process and how he gave up his H-1B visa because he wanted to be reunited with his wife and, and, and you know, make sure that his wife could come. And there were just all sorts of hoops to jump through. Um, mm -hmm. You know, really the bottom line, we want innovation we want job creation, and that's what you are coming to do. That's what, that's what you're doing, right? Absolutely. I think it's all about, like, I think Bay Area specifically being the center of gravity for great talent, for great ideas to shape, take shape, get, you know, uh, resources are important, both employees and funding, and, and, and customers, access to customers, some, some great customers who happen to be great advisors through the year. Um, so, and, and you create opportunity for everyone. Uh, and Dhruva now employs hundreds of employees across the state, um, across many states in the, in the in the U.S. So you know it it works uh, both ways. I like to ask about uh, what I call Death Valley, uh, mm -hmm. people's lowest point, maybe a a point in your career or in Dhruva's journey where you thought um, maybe this isn't going to work out. Maybe I need to toss out the plan and start from scratch. Um, did you have a moment like that? Oh yeah, totally. Many, many experiences. I think um, I think if one comes to mind is like I think back to our previous conversation. I'm I'm in the in the states. Uh, we find uh, I, I meet the Dropbox founders. We find that we have to pivot to cloud-based delivery model from software. So we're redoing the entire business to truly really pivot towards cloud. That is a great learning and a great pivot. But through the pivot, we find ourselves that we are, while we're pivoting and we are doing a, and this is a pretty hard pivot because we are telling no to a lot of customers who we made money from, raising money on a complete different plan, five years into a startup, and then pivoting into a cloud-based journey, which nobody has done before, right? So, so this $30 billion market and nobody manages cloud-based platform. So we are in a complete new journey. And then suddenly, from one side of direction, Microsoft comes chasing, chasing to uh, trying to compete. Not directly, they're not a data protection company, but the platform is similar to compete. We were dominantly solving for a problem of how do you make sure you protect information on end user devices at that time. And then Microsoft was selling Office 365, and obviously we are a no match to the Office 365 data. So how was the founder you find grit and perseverance that you're already going through one pivot and there's this trend of Microsoft coming from your side, which you really, really can't compete against. So we truly had to make a case that how do we get through this tough time by potentially diversifying our offerings into the future? How do we sustain today, we sell today, compete where we can, partner where we can, but truly in the future, diversify our offerings into many, many different platforms, which panned out to be the best decision we ever made. Wow. Um, how do you navigate a period like that and go through changes, but make sure you don't lose your true north, right? What, what the company, um, what the core idea really is. We, we praise adaptation uh, and adaptation is important, 
but then at the same time we praise authenticity and you have to get mm -hmm. it just right i mean don't you if you're if you're going to preserve both yeah absolutely as a you know philosopher azia berlin said how do you hold two contradictory thoughts in your head simultaneously that's the fun right how do you become a fox and a hedgehog at the same time you have to never give up your long term aspirations but your aspirations must match your today's capabilities and how you must dance like a fox to adapt on a daily basis i think both are exceptionally important for a ceo of a startup that never let go of that unrelenting truth that you're going to succeed in the future but never give up fighting on a daily tactics uh, every single day basis and the machiavellian principles sort of come to your mind for that what is the core belief that perhaps brought you through that period that you still carry with you it was it was you say the best decision you made how did you come to that decision and is there something in how you got there that you still use so uh, i think three things i think one is all about like a fundamental belief about the market which hasn't changed second is how should a founder ceo act both behavior wise and uh, and and strategy wise right so i think uh, in in the in the second part has sort of two different parts of it but i'll start with the the long standing belief like the, what's a truth we know today which the market doesn't know it yet right the fundamental truth we know is a 30 billion dollar market focused on data protection data management all the life cycle of data and this market has two biases which are lethal right two biases that the bias is about traditional way of doing business with hardware and software and traditional way of managing data in a, in a data center we had a refreshing thinking uh, evolved by seeing dropbox and and aws specifically that we must think about data in its future in public cloud right not locked in data center in hardware and software right so the unwavering belief even when some startups raise more money than we are worth never shook up and also only got stronger and stronger every time we proved ourselves better and better right that sort of one belief just got better and better every win we got every adversity we face also the belief got better and better right now as a ceo and founder how should i knowing know, knowing what i know today i think i i think i know two things i learned two things one is a tech founder must stay very very close to product what used to be a 10 11 years of you know uh, a technology refresh cycle or a disruption cycle is now 4 to 5 years right so ceo must unwaveringly focus on product and engineering and constantly being innovating and pushing them real up right that's sort of my my personal learning and what i put my bias in second is that knowing what i know today about adversity you know i actually look for trouble now i actually look for trouble because i feel like once i go through it it's going to be so much once i'm in it it's so miserable but once i'm through it i'm going to learn so much that you know that, like how do you again make those small mistakes to avoid the big one how do you make your life a little bit miserable you know except the personal side which you really want to safeguard and the professional side how do you make your life miserable so when they get through it you actually learn a whole lot because you know happiness never taught us anything in professional life what do you mean by look for trouble and make your life miserable it, it seems like maybe you're alluding to there's a reflex that some of us have to avoid conflict or of and is it more about suppressing that reflex or is it about actually going out and looking for actually, first stuff to start great point and i think you framed it much better than i did <laughs> uh, i think it's that avoiding that reflex of you know that healthy thoughtful conflict in a meeting you know which which people are not talking about or 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 raise a point about you know challenging you, you you know a situation is much easier the competition is much easier challenging yourself is the is the is a fun part right so how do you constantly uh, create that healthy tension and conflict to make sure the hard parts of the hard parts are spoken about dealt with and if there is a challenge looking in the corner right like is there a trend nobody is talking about that it could be lethal towards drova or towards industry should we address it head on should we acknowledge it head on start to fund it appropriately so not solving today but solving future solving mining for conflict uh, and mining for you know the the healthy areas of tension to sort of grow and absorb as a business have there been times where you wish you had done that more quickly um i think there were i think both uh, i think many many times i think most often than not when you deal with any challenge 
uh, you always feel you should have done it much quickly, e almost every single time. When it comes to either you know a business decision or an interpersonal decision or anything, right? You 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 always wish you'd done it sooner than later. It's just best for situation and the How world overall. during this pivot? During this pivot, a lot of decisions to be made. Um, you know, Microsoft is looming, bearing down on you. Did you did you already have the confidence? of naming the problem, uh, naming the challenges within the organization that might be barriers to solving the problem, having healthy conflict, or did it take you a while to get there? I think, first of all, on the Microsoft front, uh, that, that problem was like, gosh, four to five years ago, and actually, eventually we became good partners, right? Eventually, we actually diversified our revenue. Also, the, the biggest challenge and threat for Microsoft was Office 365. We actually... Uh, Almost every single time when you face an adversary front, you know, up front, you find an interesting opportunity which is actually even bigger than you ever thought. So when Office 365 was growing, we and I and I'll fast forward to the question uh, answer about pandemic as well because they intertwine. Um, we saw Office 365 as a as a as a now a position of strength. That how can we actually offer data resiliency and business continuity on that platform to to actually make make them become a partner and that turned out to be an amazing opportunity. So we, we, we found a market much bigger than we were solving. So fast forward the adversity in, in this pandemic, you know, I had this hunch in my, in, my, in my head saying, you know what, this is gonna be a bad time, bad for personal, bad for businesses, bad for the world in general. But as an entrepreneur, never wait a, waste a good crisis. You know, how do, I, how do I leverage it for the greater good of employees and for, for the business and everybody else while the times are gonna be tough? Right, so we saw the rise of Microsoft as a platform. We saw the rise of customers consuming a cloud one more, and immediately beginning of pandemic, we announced that our service is going to be free for six months for those who are trying very, very hard to digitalize themselves and hit hard by pandemic. And that opened a whole new market for us for the customers who came to us. Many hundreds of customers took an offer. Then they came back on their own terms, came back saying, "We see Drew as a great partner in this post-pandemic story of digitalization." And it created a whole new revenue stream, and the business took a uh, took a massive upswing. We uh, our data on our platform grew more than fifty percent. We doubled the amount of you know backups we do or recoveries we do. So so amazing. Uh, never waste a crisis. Sort of held true to me throughout the throughout the situation. What was the toughest conflict that you had during that period? The toughest conflict was. Uh, it's a great question, actually. The toughest conflict in my mind was. Uh, I think. Early on, it was probably in twofold. Early on was like, are we spending on growth or are we are we stopping? Because we were a fast-growing company. The toughest initial knee-jerk reaction, or knee-jerk reaction is the wrong word. Probably the the, the initial initial realization was that we have, we have to slow down to grow fast. That was the initial reaction for growth. But then it occurred to me as a parent, as an individual, that you know we have to still ask a lot of employees while they being young parents or or, or single parents or whatever situation they are in, going to be facing a lot, right? So how do we, how do we still sustain through the business? How do we, you know, Drua did not, uh, did not, you know, let go people in through the pandemic. So how do we retain a business, still grow it, but still be conscious of employees and their well-being? And that balance, there was no good answer. The balance had to be carefully dealt with and sustained through, and actually people rose to challenge. Many, many people came back and said, I'm gonna sign up for an exec comp plan, not my current comp plan, and you know, all the execs took a pay cut, and all those things came forward, and, and we won as a company. And when you say sign up for the exec comp plan, you mm -hmm. mean they're shifting away from cash and toward equity, right, the, in, in essence? We took a much higher bar and target for, for operational metrics for the, for the executives which was in many, many ways going through pandemic a, a salary cut. And many senior VPs and many senior directors and other key employees came forward and said, sign me up. I'd rather take a, take a higher target, or which may result in a smaller salary, but, but sustain the business and sustain my, you know, my, my counterparts or my colleagues. Uh, and, and we rewarded, and we, it turned out to be a great year. We rewarded uh, everybody who participated through equity and through cash eventually as we succeeded through the pandemic. And we didn't have to let go anyone. You touched maybe a little bit on something that I wonder if um, 
you believe. Uh, I'm reading into it a bit, but it seems like even during difficult times, when the temptation is to pull back, uh, you need to still have a big audacious vision in order to inspire people to keep going. You, You can't pull back on the vision. Is that part of what you were saying? Yes, absolutely. I think it's like you're skiing down the slope and if you pull back, you're just going to fall, right? You have to lean forward. You have to hunker down, but still lean, lean forward. So you have to find the, the, you know, the, the signal in the noise. You have to find in this adversary the, the opportunity which lies ahead of it. At least that's been my journey throughout. And every circumstance, every difficulty poses a very, very interesting opportunity. And and initially, you you stumbled, you're starving, but once you see through it, the joy of finding something bigger than life is just amazing. And hence, I, my point about you almost start to look for trouble because you look for adversities which will pull you forward and avoid the reflex of, of slowing down or coming down. Do you have a best failure, uh, something that didn't work out that you learned the most from? Uh, great question. Something that didn't work out. Um, I, I made many, many mistakes in my life, and still, still do. Uh, in many regards, I feel my right to sort of, you know, make as many small mistakes as I can to avoid the big one. But um, I think one mistake I learned a lot from is when I, you know, um, I paid the price also, and I didn't hire appropriately in a during a period of time. And um, and either wrong person, the wrong job, or or you know, was I was my my naive naivety into who who should be doing the job, and I ended up you know running multiple functions through the year. I, I ended up running besides my core job, running sales for a year, running you know marketing for some time, and it was hard and it was extremely big failure on my part because I hired. It was my mistake to sort of hire wrong, and many times the people were the phenomenally good people just in the wrong jobs. And um, you know, and and but but going through the time, going through the adversity, uh, it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot more uh, parts of the organization I would have never learned, um, and and uh, and also taught me how to consciously build a framework for hiring appropriately, and and growing people appropriately, and 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 fixing my own flaws. Um- but that's uh, a poignant story, an important uh, story that I've heard thematically many times uh, over the years. And you know, getting the right people in the right places, the founders make mistakes, but then they manage to recover. Just a, a great insight from Jaspreet Singh, uh, the CEO and co-founder of Druva. Um, it's Friday. Uh, we're going to leave it there. Uh, thank you to Druva and Jaspreet Singh for sharing those great insights on Fort Knox. I'll see you next time.